Hey, I'm here in New York City in Chinatown. I want to introduce our speaker today. His name is John Freed. Now, John's a guy I've known for a long time. And you may not know this, but John is a part of our Daybreak family. And John is here today to share the word. He's been a successful leader in ministry for many years. And he recently moved to Grand Rapids with his wife, Danielle, and his two beautiful children. We're so glad that they're a part of the Daybreak family, and I'm excited that he is going to be sharing our stage and opening the word with us today. So I want you to welcome John Freed. Oh, yeah, it's good to be at Daybreak this morning. Honestly, I cannot be more excited about preaching anywhere uh, but at our home church, our new family church, Daybreak Church. Give it up for everybody here. Yeah. My wife, Danielle, and my family, we just moved here literally like a year ago. We unpacked some boxes and started setting up because we knew school was going to be starting soon. And we just moved here to Hudsonville, and we were so excited to come and visit uh, this church called Daybreak. And while we are not new to Daybreak Church at all, which I'll share with you in a minute, we were new to the Daybreak family. And I just, we got to tell you, we absolutely love making this church our home. And yes, my wife preached last Sunday. And if you missed it, you need to go online and listen and watch that and learn from her. She's a very smart woman. Trust me, she's been telling me what to do for 18 years. <laughs> And I've done probably 35% of it, and it's obvious if I would have just done the 100%. I want to say hello to all of those online, and thank everybody on site for being here this morning. I'm excited about preaching this morning, and I feel pretty good about things because as I just kind of sat on the front row, and I just kind of evaluated the situation, I thought this is going to be a good morning because I got my uh, connections group, my Daybreak Connections group here. And if you're not a part of that this fall, they're coming. You'll want to sign up for those. But I got Steve right down here, one of the best encouragers in all of our family right here. And he's going to tell me throughout my whole sermon, you're doing good. You're doing a good job. He already told me. I was just sitting here doing nothing. He went, like, like <laughs> you're sitting there doing nothing so well, John. Keep it up. Like, he's just so encouraging. And then over here... Over here is Tim Way, like the smartest dude in the world. He's read more books than you could ever imagine reading, all right? He's got a library at home. How many of you have a library at home? It's not as big as Tim's, I'll tell you that right now, okay? And Tim is the smartest guy, and if I start to go off, you know, on a tangent and I'm totally wrong, I'm going to look over and he's going to be like, like, go ahead, you're right, you're right. And if, he look, if I look over there and he's like, you're an idiot. You're, then I'm going to stop and we'll go on to a different subject, okay, Tim? And then right down here, volunteer Lisa. Everybody say, hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. You don't know this, but Lisa's down here because <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. Danielle and I, we preach in a lot of churches, okay? Like we travel and sometimes she's in a church and I'm across somewhere else in a church. It happens. And we, but we have, <laughs> we have never preached in a church that opens with a kiss cover, okay? <laughs> that is not normal, right? And then I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm about to preach. And they're like Dirk Bentley covering it up here. You know what I mean? Like Burning Man. Lisa's role. You don't maybe know Lisa, but Lisa sits down here. She's got a microphone that goes straight to Jesus. And, uh, and she sits here. And I asked her, I said, Lisa, you volunteer here. What's your role? And she's like, you know, I just make sure that this thing doesn't, this train doesn't go off the tracks. You know what I mean? Like when you're starting with a kiss cover and you're doing a Dirk Bentley song and then Jeff's talking from Chinatown. What's he doing in Chinatown, right? Like, what in the world's going on here? Lisa is here to keep it on the tracks. Give it up for Lisa, huh? Yes. I got like the holy trinity of preaching at daybreak going on. How can I mess up, right? Two weeks ago, you had Troy Evans here, and he did an awesome job. And so... Troy, then Danielle, and now I'm like, eh, you know, it'll be okay. It'll be someone's coming next week, okay? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Man, I'm so glad to be here, and um, let me just tell you our story real quick, just so you can know how much I do appreciate this church 
and then how excited uh, we feel like to be in this church family. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that to just be like make you feel good or anything. Like I'm going to ask you to borrow 20 bucks after service. I'm not going to do that. But I'm just telling you this is a very special place for us. And the reason for that is because when I was 11 years old, my dad sat our family down. We were living in Port Huron, Michigan, on the other side of the state. And he says, I really feel like God's telling us to go and move to this awful, dreadful, horrible, sinful place called Ohio. And um, they need Jesus in Ohio. Can I get an amen? Okay. And so they need Jesus in Ohio. And who better to bring it to them than a Michigander? Can I get an amen, right? I mean, come on. And so uh, he said, we're going to go and we're going to start a church in Dayton, Ohio. Start a church. Like, what does that mean? What does that look like? What are you talking about, Dad? And so he said, um, it's hard for me to explain to you what we're going to do, but there are people in Dayton, Ohio, who are far from God, and we want to help introduce them and invite them into a life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. It went something like that. I'm 11 years old. I'm paraphrasing. So he says, for you to really understand, for our family to really grasp an idea of what we wanted to do in Ohio, someone had told my dad about this crazy couple called Wes and Claudia Dupin, and that they were starting a church on the west side of Michigan. So our family, we loaded up in the car and we drove over here one morning and I had never gone to a church in a middle school in my whole life. How many of you were there in the middle school for daybreak church? Yeah. And so I got to go the first time. I remember walking in like, what in the world is going on? What is this all about? And just like kind of an awe inspiring moment. Like this is church. You can do this. You could sing that. You could have that. Like you could do this is church. We moved to Ohio and my dad started a church in a bar. So I grew up going to church in a bar. That explains a lot to you, doesn't it? So Kiss Songs and Dirk Bentley, I'm like, let's do this. You know, it was like a, it was like a thing. It was like, we can do this. We got to tell everybody and anybody about Jesus Christ. This idea of kingdom expansion, which I'm going to share with you briefly this morning, but this idea of kingdom expansion began because my dad sat with a guy named Wes in Hudsonville and talked about how they loved to serve the Lord and would love to reach lost people for Jesus. So that part of my story, that life-changing event of moving to Ohio and my dad starting the church is a part of my story. It's part of my life. This church and the boldness and the focus and the calling on this church God used in the calling of, of my life. A few years later in college, uh, I met my wife, Danielle. And she was talented and pretty and smart and, and, and all these things. And, and she said, look, we were getting kind of serious in our relationship. And she said, look, um, my uncle is starting a church, right? He's starting a church in this little dink town where she grew up called Lapel, Indiana, and when we went to visit that church and, and I met the pastor and everything and heard the story of that church and later we would volunteer and Danielle would go on staff at that church. But you know what? Uncle Richard, her uncle who started the church, Uncle Richard, you know what he did? When he wanted to start a church in Lapel, someone said, you need to go see this place in Hudsonville, Michigan called Daybreak. And so uh, Richard, he gets in the truck and he drives from central Indiana up here and he sat down with Wes and Claudia and he shared his vision and he heard their vision. He said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And you know what? They went back home to LaPel. You know what they named that church in LaPel? Daybreak. You know what we named that church in Ohio? Daystar, which is the same name as Daybreak. And this, this church here, for decades now, has been expanding God's kingdom. In 2010, Danielle and I started a church. Uh, really, what we started doing is telling people about Jesus. You want to know how you start a church? You just tell everybody you know about Jesus. And when they discover the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ in their life, when they experience Jesus, you won't be able to stop them from gathering to worship him. That's how you start churches. And so in 2010, Danielle and I deeply desired to reach this community called Noblesville. 
And through that process, we launched the church, Waterline Church. And over the next eight years, ten years of our ministry there, the Lord used Waterline and all of our friends and our church family there, that congregation there is a lot like Daybreak and that it just had a heart for lost people. And it was this incredible opportunity that Danielle and I had to be a part of this congregation. And in 2019, uh, Outreach Magazine uh, named Waterline Church as one of its top 100 reproducing churches in America. Because we were able to help start so many churches uh, around central Indiana. Yeah, I, and yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. But the reason I share that with you is because back when I was 11 years old and when Danielle was in high school, this place called Daybreak was a place of nudging. Nudge. Give, give your neighbor a nudge. Just give him a nudge. Say, hey, hey. Give them a little, not too hard, I mean, we don't want bruises, but just a little nudge. It was, it was that in our life. And what I want to talk to you about today is kingdom expansion, because out of that experience at Waterline, Danielle and I were able to learn a lot through our congregation. They taught us a ton about what it means to, to lead a congregation, but what it means to help start more congregations. It wasn't just Danielle and I. We were along for the ride with Waterline. And God blessed that situation today. Today, we're able to help start, launch new works, fresh expressions of God's good news in all kinds of communities around the area. Uh, my buddy Phil, he's in Chicago, and he's helped starting a church under a bridge for the homeless of Chicago. How cool is that, right? And, I mean, I, Michael, who's in, um, in the Detroit area, and Michael has a catering background. He owns a very successful business, but he's also a pastor. And he is starting this ministry where he's hiring and employing people to disciple them, to raise them up, to teach them culinary sk skills, and then send them out so they can start their own business, so they can have their own ministry. It's just this powerful thing. I can't tell you who it is, but there is a person in an urban core in one of our, Danielle and I serve, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan. We serve about 800 pastors, 500 pastors, 170 churches in those areas. But one of our pastors, one of our churches, one of our leaders has started a ministry for Muslim women so that they can have dignity and they can learn so many new things. And I can't tell you all the details about that, but just hearing their story and hearing what God is doing there is incredible. Incredible. Jim in Tustin, Michigan, small town in northern Michigan there. He started a school. He started a church in a middle school. And I share all these stories with you because they're your story. And Danielle and I, we get to go from our church family here at Daybreak, and we get to go out and encourage pastors and encourage leaders and encourage churches. But you have to know, as our church family, you did that in us a long time ago before you even knew it, and we get to do it for you, with you, in other churches all over our region. So honestly, hear my heart. I'm so pumped to be here this morning and tell you that. And I want to thank you for the mission and the ministry of this church. And listen, we came about a year ago, so we got to be through the transition of Pastor Wes and Claudia and now Jeff and Ariana and just, and just incredible leadership of the elders of this church and the board of this church. It's just been absolutely amazing. All right, let's jump into this really quick. Um, let me ask you a question before I, before I start teaching. The question is this, and it's just a question I just want to kind of lay on the table. You don't have to answer yes or no right away. I just want to ask you, do you believe in miracles? We're talking about foundations, and as we talk about kingdom expansion, when it comes to, to the foundational belief of Christians, one of the foundational beliefs of Christians is in miracles, believing in the unimaginable, the unexplainable, but the undeniable. And that these miracles are small little signs that point us to a greater truth. It's showing us what God is up to, what God is doing, and the heart of God. That's what miracles are. So I have to ask you, as you read through the Bible and as you go through your own life, do you believe in miracles? Because when I read the Bible, I watch Jesus sit down with his disciples, and he says, and he shows them, and he said, this is how you live in the kingdom of God, and you learn to lean in 
You lean your heart on it. You lean your mind on it. You learn your spirit, your soul on it, your strength and your abilities and your gifting. All of it leans on the idea that God is going to do something extraordinary through your life, that God has a plan for your life, that God's not done in your life, that God is doing something. So do you believe in miracles? In John chapter 14, Jesus said this to the disciples. He says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. You could ask me, you could ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And yet I wonder if we don't live out every day going, man, we're worried about stuff. We got this problem. We got this dilemma. We got all these things going on. But do we believe in miracles? Let me ask you this question. Show of hands. How many, if you believed in miracles, don't believe it doesn't really matter, but how many of you would like to have a miracle in your life? Anybody? Anybody want to have a miracle in your life? Anybody? All right. All right. Thank you. Someone backstage like, yeah, get on with it, buddy. All right. <laughs> Listen, we got, I want you to have a miracle. Here's the, I'm just going to give you one key, one way to have a miracle in your life. But let's look at John chapter 2. John chapter 2. If you want to have a miracle in your life, here's the very first miracle recorded in Scripture. I think we can learn a lot from it. John chapter 2 says, The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Now the wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. Now, there's some tension in the room right now, okay? So they're at a party, right? Jesus is like, hey, hey, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're having a good time. And I don't know how it came up, but someone's like, my glass is empty. And people are kind of like, oh, well, what are we going to do? We need some wine. You know, the party's still going. I mean, the, the festivities for a Jewish wedding goes for a long time. It's awesome. And so Mary comes to Jesus, and she's like, hey, um, they ran out of wine. I don't know about, I just, when I read that, and, and then his response is like, woman, uh, it's not my problem, right? Like, like yesterday, and again, I tell you, I, I don't, I have a real problem not following Danielle's directions on a lot of things, but Danielle, Diana and I, we were out in the pond, and we were swimming, and we were having a good old time, and Danielle's like, hey, you need to get some sunscreen on. You got to preach tomorrow at daybreak. You can't have a red face when you preach at daybreak. I'm like, woman, this ain't your problem. So I'm trying to shield myself because I didn't want to get out of the pond. I'm so lazy. I can't go put sunscreen on. Do you know what it felt like a few hours later to come up to Danielle and be like, hey, um, you know where the aloe is in the house? I can't really find the aloe. I'm just looking for the aloe. <laughs> There's this moment right here in the scripture where Mary's like, hey, the wine ran out. And Jesus' like, woman, this isn't really my problem, you know what I mean? Because here's the deal. Jesus knows if he does this miracle at this moment, at this time, it starts a ticking countdown to the cross. Like everybody here is going to know he's not ordinary. Everybody here is going to know that this rabbi is actually something very spectacular. And if he does this miracle, it starts it. Mary knows that Jesus is the solution to every problem you will ever face. Mary knows that Jesus is here. That the time is now. And the reason she knows the time is now is because she has the Holy Spirit. She's had experience discerning Holy Spirit in her life, right? Like this, this Holy Spirit. I mean, it was the Holy. I don't know if you've ever had a virgin pregnancy. <laughs> you kind of remember something like that, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that ha Holy Spirit, that discerning, okay, God, what are you doing? Okay, God, this doesn't look ordinary. How do we solve this? How do we get through this? It was the Holy Spirit that prompted Mary and Joseph 
to flee to Egypt as refugees to save the life of Jesus. So when Jesus is like, woman, it ain't my problem. Mary's like, okay, maybe you weren't there, but I was there when the Holy Spirit showed up. So Mary knows. So she nudges. Mary knows who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is. And she has practiced this ability to say, God, what are you up to right now? What are you doing now? When the wine runs out at a wedding that you're just merely invited to, right? You ever been invited to a wedding and you're like, I barely know these people. We're going to go. I sh- we should probably go. You go. They sit you at some back table and, you know, the wine run out. I'm like, peace out. You know what I mean? I'm out. I'm gone. Mary sees every problem as an opportunity for God's kingdom to show up in an extraordinary way. Mary understands that every dilemma is an opportunity. Every problem is solved by one solution and one solution only, Jesus. And she's at a wedding And she knows Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is working and moving. We're getting some more wine. Watch this. Verse 5, but mother told the servants, but his mother told the servants, she doesn't even have a discussion about it. She, uh uh-huh. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. I love that verse. I underline that in my Bible. Do whatever he tells you. That's just like pure discipleship right there. When you've experienced miracles, you learn trust. When you experience miracles, little, tiny, I I know maybe some of you believe in luck, coincidence. I don't believe in any of that stuff. I believe in miracles. I believe that God shows up in little ways and arranges little things. I couldn't have planned to be a part of the Daybreak family as influential as it's been in our lives. Mary says, do whatever he tells you. Verse 6, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars have been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. Now, I like this. This is like a little math story problem, okay? There's, there's uh, six stone water jars. How many? Six stone water jars, okay? And they hold about 20 to 30 gallons of water. We'll just say 25, make it easy, okay? So six times 25 is? (laughs) Three people. 150! Everybody else is like, well, no, I have no idea how much that is. Do you know how much that is? I have no clue. Get get your iPhone out. Get the calculator out. He's doing math again. All right, so there's six times 24 is 150. Am I right, Tim? How am I doing? Steve, how am I, how am I doing? Okay, okay, he's over. He's not encouraging me. Come on, Steve, pick it up. Pick it up. <laughs> they have, that's a, it's 150 gallons. Now, I don't know if you're a drinker in the room, but look at this. Watch this, watch this. Six times 25 is 150 gallons. That's 19,200 ounces. I don't know how big the party is. I don't know what kind of drinking they're doing at this party, but that's 632 ounce big gulps of wine. Okay, that's a lot of wine. That is a lot of wine. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, Lord, you could have made enough wine for the people in the room, but you're making big gulp size wine. You know what I mean? Like, this is a little much here. But in just a few chapters, John, G- Jesus tells his disciples, he says, whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Look, every miracle points to a greater truth. And the greater truth is this. When the wine runs out, Jesus is more than enough for you. He is more than enough for solution in your life. You don't need to compliment or stipend or fill in for Jesus. You don't need to back him up. You don't need, listen, you can trust him. That's what miracles teach us. 
And this miracle here for the disciples and for the people at this wedding who had no idea who Jesus was at this moment, he's saying in a big, loud, big gulp, lift the cup, you can trust me. And John records it so that you in your life, when the wine runs out, can say, I can trust him because he's more than enough. He's not a plan B or a plan C or anything. He is the only solution, the only plan that we need right now. This is why Paul writes, and I love this, absolutely love this. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. It's so big. It's so huge. It's 600 big gulps of wine big. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You need a definition of what a miracle is? It's something happening that is way beyond what you think could happen. This next part of the scripture gets me pumped and excited. John writes to us, Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars had been filled, he said, now, now dip out some of and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. And when the master of ceremonies tasted water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come, though, of course, here's the line, though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. And then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept, but you have kept the best until now. I tell you this story in scripture. Because as a pastor leading in a global pandemic, everything you know about ministry goes out the window. And I, I got to sit down multiple times with Pastor Wes and Claudia and Danielle and I just shooting ideas and talking with them and, and honestly just learning from them. But to hear Pastor Wes sit across the table and talk about how much he loves this church family. You wonder why someone does ministry like that for, I think he did it for a, a thousand years. Um, it's because he loves you. It's evident he loved his church family. But when this thing happened a lot of pastors and we visit a lot of pastors and they're like you know what's going to happen what's going on and but I'll tell you we come to uh, daybreak to our church family here and we watch you and we're inspired by you because here's what I see God doing I see an incredible last 30 years, daybreak, you know, you've reached thousands of people for Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden we have this thing, this, you know, Wes retires and Pastor Jeff is here. I mean, we're blessed, absolutely blessed to have Pastor Jeff and Ariana. But it's like, okay, where, what, 
we come back. I love that Pastor Jeff has brought us back to the foundations. And this verse right here, I have held on to this in my own life in so many seasons and so many times. Because the wine runs out. That's what wine does. And when that master of ceremony stands up and he says, but the best is now. The best is now. I believe there is somebody here today that the wine has run out in your health or in your finances or in your marriage or in your future. And maybe so many doors have closed and the wine has run out. And when I ask the question about miracles, you say, maybe I used to believe in miracles. And maybe I used to believe that God could show up and do something else. Listen, the best is now. The best is now. I believe that God did incredible things through daybreak. He's changed my life because of this church. He's changed Danielle's life because of this church. You know what, though? I walked into this church a year ago with my family. Do you know what it felt like to tell my kids in the car, hey, Dean, you're 11 years old. When I was 11 years old, I went to daybreak too. And we walked in, and you know what I saw on the faces of Dean and Deanna, my kids? That, wow. Wow. The best, the best is now daybreak. The best is now. Because there are people all over this community who need a nudge. And there's no better church family and there's no better church to do that than daybreak. You've done it. You've been doing it. And the best is now. Here's what I believe. I believe somebody here today needs a nudge. Somebody here needs an invite. Somebody here needs an investment. Somebody here needs a smile. Somebody here needs just to be brought into what God is doing. There's a friend, there's a neighbor, there's a coworker, there's a relative. There's an acquaintance that you know that does not have a relationship with God. They are far from God. And if they could have an encounter with Jesus Christ, it would change everything. You know that because you have had that. And you have that so that you can be that nudge. You know, so you nudge. That's who we are. And daybreak... I'm excited about being a part of this church family because who will we nudge? There's people that need this church. I'm going to ask our pastor to come out, Pastor Jeff, and I'm going to ask that he would close this experience for us. Thank you, thank you. I'm not in Chinatown, by the way. I'm here. John, you're such a dear friend, you and Danielle and your family. We're so glad. Aren't, aren't you glad they're a part of the Daybreak family? Thank you. Thank you for that good word. Such a powerful word. A temptation for preachers to come back and, and reiterate what you just said, but he said it so well and so powerfully. And so thank you, John, for, for your word today. And um, thanks for, for your part here in our Daybreak family. Can we thank John again for the word this morning? Thank you, brother. Well, we've, we've been away a little bit, just resting up, getting ready. And so me, Arianna, we are so excited about this new season of Daybreak. And we just couldn't stay away. We didn't know if we we're going to be here or not. That's kind of why we had that pre-recorded message. But we just could not stay away from you because we do love this church family so much. And we are so excited about what God is going to continue to do to provide for our lives individually, for our families, for this church congregation, church body, for our community. There's a lot of fear out there. But listen, God's provision never runs out. I was telling my neighbor this week, I was a little bit afraid about some things going on. I said, God takes care of his people, doesn't he? He takes care of his people. And he will take care of us and he will take care of you. And I cannot wait to see how that unfolds as we go into this new adventure together. I just have to say that this week was a pretty powerful week for our church. 
we had Spring Hill Day Camp here, and I'm going to ask our children's pastor, Chris, to come out, and I'm going to ask John to jump off the keys and come up here and join me for a second, because we've got so many amazing things happening with families, with students, with children, and I want you, uh, just in case you don't know, this is not Elton John, this is Chris Decker, the mayor. And uh, this is John Rink, and John does a lot of things here as well, but he works with our students. And these represent a whole team, an army of people. I spent today a lot of time down in Hiptown just encouraging those leaders down there that are taking care of our kids and our families. And tonight there'll be a gathering, John and all the adult leaders and students will be hanging out tonight. And we need to, we need to appreciate and thank these people and all the team of volunteers that are helping us raise up godly kids in this generation, in this time. And this week, we had Spring Hill. And you shared something with me, Chris, this morning that I want you to share one specific thing that happened this week at Spring Hill. Well, we know we don't have all the numbers yet, but we know for sure that five kids accepted Christ this week. Man, I think, I think that was a nice, polite golf clap. But seriously, think about what she just shared. Five kids' lives were changed for eternity. Can we just do that one more time and really celebrate? Because that's amazing. That's more like it, isn't it? That's good. And John, we just appreciate you, brother, and what you do with our students and this is an exciting season coming up, and we're grateful for your leadership. And I, I want us to pray uh, for God's provision as we wrap up our time today. But also, let's pray it into the next generation. Can we do that together? So would you stand with me as we conclude our time today? Father, we thank you for what you're doing here at Daybreak. Lord, we thank you for the word that was delivered to our hearts today through John. And Lord, we need to be that nudge. Lord, you're going to be nudging us this week at work, at school, at our homes, in our neighborhoods, and interacting with people. However we do, wherever we do, whenever we do, Lord, help our hearts to be open to the nudge of your Holy Spirit that says, invite them to daybreak. Tell them about me. Encourage them. Give. Be generous. Whatever it might be. Lord, we thank you for nudging our hearts today. We thank you for what happened this week with Spring Hill Day Camp. This church was filled with children. We thank you for the generosity of those that helped to provide that experience, to help scholarship students, to, to kids to be here, Lord. We thank you for just the, the amazing week that you gave us uh, in ministering to our kids. We thank you for Chris. Emily, their team, Lord, all the volunteers, all those that pour into these precious little kids that are with us, part of our families, Lord. We thank you for John and the team, and we pray, Lord, that your provision would go into that generation in a time where there's so much confusion and mixed messages and myths and lies about you and about themselves and about the world. Lord, we just pray you bring clarity and faith and love and hope to this generation of students, Lord. We're so grateful for what you're doing in our families and our students and our kids, Lord. We celebrate that today, and we thank you. We thank you again for the privilege to gather here today as your people. We are a gathering people, and so we thank you for the opportunity, the privilege to be together, to recognize and celebrate you, Lord, and to walk away filled with your hope again. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I want you to have a great week. Maybe hit the beach, do something fun today. We'll see you next week.